Let's talk about hyperbolic functions, and let's dive right in with the definitions. We have the hyperbolic sine of x, which we often refer to as just cinch. That's how we say it. We say cinch. We don't say hyperbolic sine all the time. That's way too many syllables. So cinch x is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. And cosh is how we say hyperbolic cosine. Cosh x is e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. What's cool about these is how they're defined, right? So we have these wonderful functions, and there's going to be more of them and a bunch of identities and all this other stuff. But the cool thing is they're defined using E's. So really, the reason we study them in calculus is because it gives us a chance to continue working with our E's along with all our derivatives and integrals and everything like that without having to define new derivative techniques or integral techniques. So really, we're just having fun with these functions. I have to say, at least in, in my experience, they're not at all central to much of math or physics. So we, when we see these, we're tempted to think like, oh, this is the new thing. It's, it's going to somehow supplant trigonometry or something like that. That's not the case. These are kind of a fringe topic, though I'm sure in certain applications, they're super useful. But in general, it's really just a chance for us to keep playing with some of our calculus techniques and apply them somewhere new. So treat everything you learn about hyperbolic functions as having fun, really, because that's really what we're doing here. Okay, so there's our cinch and our cosh. Well, how about hyperbolic tangent, tanch? We can have that as well. And it's defined the way we'd expect it to be. So here we have tanch x, hyperbolic tangent is cinch x over cosh x, which also equals e to the x minus e to the minus x over the quantity e to the x plus e to the minus x. And that just follows from the definitions of cosh and cinch. Let's try some examples before we go too much further here. Okay, for part A, we have evaluate tanch of zero. Okay, well, we just plug in zero to our tanch function. There's really not much else to it. So we have e to the zero minus e to the minus zero, all over e to the zero plus e to the minus zero. Well, of course, e to the zero and e to the minus zero are both uh, one. So we have one minus one over one plus one, zero over two, which is zero. Okay, not so bad. For part B, we have tanch of one. So let's try the same thing with one. Okay, so we have e to the one, so a little bit more going on here, right? E minus e to the minus one. Okay, so now we have issues, right? E to the over e to the one plus e to the minus one. Okay, well, let's bring this into fraction form. Looks like we have e minus one over e here, all over e plus one over e. We can do a common denominator here on the top and the bottom. Or another way to think of this is, so you can think of it as common denominator on the top and the bottom. Another thing we can do here, it's the same, it gives the same result, multiply both the top and the bottom by e. So really we're multiplying by e over e. What that does for us is that gets us e squared minus one over e squared plus one. Same result if we did the common denominator, which we could keep like that, or we could write in decimal form. If we computed that out, we get 0.762 about if we round it. Okay, lastly, we have cinch of natural log four. Okay, so let's plug this into the cinch formula here. We have e to the natural log of four minus e to the negative natural log of four all over two. Well, e and natural log undo each other when they're right next to each other, right? Because this is these are the inverse functions. So e and the natural log undo each other, just leaving four for this first term. But in the second term, we have a problem. They're not right next to each other. We have this negative here. So the key is to bring this negative up to the exponent. That's the properties of logarithms. So the second one becomes, so let's see, I'll just write the first one as four. We're done with that one, minus e to the natural log four to the negative one. See what I did there? I brought this negative up to the exponent as a negative one. It's a standard technique when dealing with e to the natural log of things is to, br if you have something between e and the natural log, a constant or a negative, to bring it up to the power of the number inside natural log 
so that we can essentially cancel the e in the natural log. Okay, so this is still all over 2. Well, this becomes 4 minus 1 fourth all over 2. All right, so it's just arithmetic from here. Let's see, we can get a common denominator, do a 4 over 4 here, right? You know, we have fractions. And go from there. So we have 16 minus 1 over 4 all over 2. Well, when you have a fraction above just a number, it essentially bumps down. So this is all going to be over 8. And then 16 minus 1 is 15. So 15 eighths. Next, let's define a few more hyperbolic functions. Okay, so we've seen hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine, and tangent, right? And now we have a couple of new ones. We have cotangent, which is similar to the trig definition, right? It's just one over tangent. So we have cosh over cinch, e to the x plus e to the minus x over e to the x minus e to the minus x. And hyperbolic secant, 1 over cosh, same way as we'd expect from trigonometry, 2 over e to the x plus e to the minus x, and hyperbolic cosecant, which is 1 over cinch, so that gives us 2 over e to the x minus e to the minus x. So you can see there's quite an analogy with trigonometry happening here, though it's a little different. So we know how these functions are defined, and we can work with them, but we still don't really know what they are. So let's take a look at that. Let's compare trigonometric functions to hyperbolic functions. For trigonometric functions, we start with the unit circle. We have x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now, to define a point on the unit circle, right, maybe here, we could think of this as a line going up to that point and some angle, we'll call it t. Okay, and then this point on the unit circle would be well, the x value is given by cos t, and the y value is given by sin t. Okay, so similarly, over on the hyperbolic side, here's our half hyperbola, because we're only letting x be greater than 0. So we only, we're only getting one half of the hyperbola here. right? Remember, normal hyperbola would kind of have both sides of this going, but we don't need that other side. We're only looking at one side. And similarly here, you have a point on the hyperbola, and that's going to be defined by x value now cosh t and cinch t. Okay, well, what's t? Is it an angle somehow? Maybe in here? No, that doesn't really make sense, right? That can't be t, that because this thing's moving around. It's not really defining a well-defined angle here. It's something a little unexpected. If we were to connect the origin up to this point like so, and then fill in this area down here. So we're looking at the area of this shape, right? So we stop where we get to the actual hyperbola itself. This area here, this area is t over 2. So when we talk about cosh t and cinch t, we're talking about that area we're actually doubling that area because this is only the area over 2. So we're essentially doubling that. And when we talk about cosh t and cinch t, that's what we're using instead of angles. So that's just a little bit of background of where these functions come from and a bit of the analogy between hyperbolic functions and trigonometric functions. Luckily for us, for now, this isn't going to be important at all. We can do everything we need to do with these functions analytically just using those E definitions. So we are off the hook in having to know about hyperbolas or anything else like that. But it's good to see kind of where they come from, or at least how they fit in, or what the analogy is between hyperbolic functions and trigonometric functions. Okay, so finally, let's wrap up by talking about the graphs of these hyperbolic functions themselves. And we'll do that over in Desmos. So what I've done here is I've graphed two functions, e to the x over 2 and e to the minus x over 2, because we can easily obtain cos x by adding those two together. So imagine if we added these two graphs together, we'd get kind of another graph up here that looks kind of like a parabola, but it's certainly not a parabola. That's our cosh graph. So there, I've added that in, in the purple there. Let's maybe hide those e to the x graphs, leaving just the cosh graph. 
So there it is, and one of the main applications of hyperbolic cosine or cosh that is very frequently associated with is the sagging of power lines. Right, so this is, of course, an exaggerated case, but if you had some manipulations here and you worked with some constants to make this just right, this models how power lines sag as you go from one pole to the next pole. And I don't know if you know, they sag more with the more power that goes through them. So those sagging power lines are modeled with Cauch functions. Let's look at cinch. Okay, for cinch, we have e to the x over 2 and then minus e to the minus x over 2. Because, of course, cinch is e to the x over 2 minus e to the minus x over 2. So when we add these two together, we'll get a nice function that essentially goes in between them in a very nice way. And that's our cinch function. Here it is in purple. I'll get rid of these e graphs so we can see just the cinch function. But if you ever need to graph it on your own, use those e graphs to guide you. And then you can kind of add them together to get your cinch function. It's a nice function. We have this thing just goes. There's no asymptotic behavior, though. So it looks kind of like tangent without the asymptotes. It just keeps going to the left and to the right. So uh, a useful function to have in our toolkit, especially as we're modeling things. We want something with behavior like a tangent without the asymptotes. We have cinch. OK, finally, let's look at tanch. OK, let's just dive right into this graph. It looks a lot like the arctan graph. If you remember what that graph looked like, it has this really nice behavior. Arctan of x had asymptotes at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. Here's a graph with asymptotes at y equals 1 and y equals negative 1. So again, a very useful tool to have for modeling or even just mathematics if you need a nice function with this behavior that has those kinds of asymptotes.